Hello, we're here today at the beautiful Van Loon Museum with the organizer of a show of Jean Bologna, Valentine Bevel. Ba um, Valentine, could you tell us a little about the show? Uh, yes, the uh, show was organized uh, or planned at the beginning of this year by um, Museum Amstelkring. Museum Amstelkring, uh, uh, um, its director was uh, going to New York and met there the collector of these beautiful uh, exhibited at the Sound O'Reilly Galleries in New York. Uh, decided it would be a very good idea to send them to Europe where they would be shown for the first time. So in September we basically started gathering the money together to sponsor this show and um, it took us about two months to get all the money in gear and we talked with the director of Museum van Loon and said you have the most exquisite little palace to show these statues in, can we show them in your place? And he was very happy to accommodate us. And um, Michael Hall, the director of the Museum van Loon, uh, organized then this show, or let me organize it in collaboration with the Rex Museum, who's organize, which is organizing the Adrienne de Vries show, Adrienne de Vries, who is, of course, the famous pupil of Gian Bologna. Um, about Gian Bologna, um, he was originally from a place in the southern Netherlands at that time, now northern France, Douai. Um, he showed very early on in his life great talent for uh, the visual arts. Um, was a student of Jacques Dubruc, who is now a somewhat lesser known, but among uh, connoisseurs, a very famous Flemish sculptor. Decide, decided in 1555, which is also the Roman Holy Year, to go to Italy and see what else he could learn and to complete his studies and to study also, of course, all the antique statuary that can be found there. He went to Rome and then he went to Naples and then finally he came to Florence and in Florence people said, this guy has an enormous amount of talent. And then he very quickly actually found work, made statues and his fame spread so fast that the Medici family really was interested in meeting him. like to be our court sculptor. Now, as, as it goes at that time, I mean, the, it, it, the, the best way for a sculptor to make his money and be very successful is to be in the service of a royal family uh, who will then take care of the, the Medicis, uh, who will then take care of not only commissioning statues, him to do uh, smaller statuettes to give to their princely friends at the courts in Europe. And Gian Bologna has made really his fame not only because he made the, the large statues at the Piazza della Signoria in Florence or not because he made the beautiful marble statues for the Medici palaces but also because he had an enormously successful and a uh, magnet for Sculpting Europe workshop in Florence where an enormous amount of smaller statuettes were made that really were the sort of gifts to all the friends of the Medici family and the other royal neighbors that the Medici had. And of that production, we have here about 70 statuettes. And it's a very, very rare exhibit in, in Northern Europe. Uh, there has been an previous Gian Bologna exhibition in London in 1978 um, and this is then the first on the continent outside of let's say the places where Gian Bologna was of course active in Italy. And there's a, a story I read about he went at one point he admired very much Michelangelo yeah. and uh, went to visit him while he was still alive. Uh, yeah. Could you relate that to me? Well the, the, the story is actually from Vasari Fazari is, of course, the great Renaissance biographer who made us all really know what Michelangelo is about and all those other Renaissance geniuses that we know of. 
uh, in his uh, uh, life of, uh, of, of lives of, of, of the artists. Um, he wrote that, uh, that someone elderly, Michelangelo, was visited by John Bologna, and John Bologna had, of course, brought, as every uh, young artist does when he uh, finds an eminence Greece who he can show his work to some of his own work, showed it to Michelangelo. Michelangelo looked at it, looked very carefully at it, and said, this is really very fine, but it's not very well composed. The thing is, what you have to learn, John Bologna, is that you really have to take care not to finish before you've actually completed your composition. Now, this is very serious criticism, because what you're telling it, a, a, a sculptor to do, or what he has done, is that he's been having a lot of eye for detail while the actual piece isn't yet made, isn't yet completed, finished. And the thing is that it is as with anything else you make, you know, you don't, you don't make the finish on a thing when the composition isn't good. So John Bologna was very, very distraught and came back, and, but of course it, this coming from the great Michelangelo took it to heart and made sure that he'd never do that again. But the thing is that, of course, one thing that remains of this story, which is very interesting if you look at John Bologna's work, he is, of course, famous for composition, for his pieces, for his bravoure, for his delicate balance. But he's incredibly famous for his finish. Because very, very few of his contemporaries or successors were so interested in making such an incredibly smooth surface. Now, Cellini had it to some extent, and Bernini had it to some extent. You know, the Baroque sculptors had it to some extent. But of course, if you look at Michelangelo, for example, but also to some extent Ariane de Vries, you say they weren't so interested in this utter finish at the end of the product. Finish, which is also, of course, part the work of the person who casts the statue rather than the person who makes it. But John Bologna insisted on it. So I think from Vasari's story, you learn that John Bologna already then was seen as somebody who had made things really, really too fine sometimes without spending enough time with the composition. And I think this is one of the reasons why John Bologna is so much less famous now than he was then, as opposed to Michelangelo. Because we, of course, fall completely for the idea that a, a sculpture makes one piece, and it is his idea, it is his div divine genius that makes, you know, a, a form, a shape. And if that shape has all its hairs parted right, or his muscles rightly set, is secondary to us. We like it, but we call it virtuosity rather than genius or really artistry. And the thing is that one of the things that this exhibit does, I think, is really show that Fazari and on the other hand, there's also genius to be found in the very, very, very fine detail and attention one part in the end, without letting anything slip, without letting anything to the imagination on that front. And I, I, I think that this exhibit shows that very, very well. Now, Jean Bologna was known as a mannerist. Um, and this elongate the figure or, or something. Could you explain mannerism to me? I... Uh, somewhat in the same vein as, uh, as, as the last uh, answer I gave, uh, mannerism is a little bit a, 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 uh, a, a word, a term that is used somewhat like the Goths who sacked Rome, right? We, all we know about the Goths were that they were barbarians and stupid and uncivilized and brute and, and all that. But of course it's the historical opinion of the Romans that we're looking at, and that's how we know the Goths. We know the mannerists and mannerism through the eyes of the people that didn't like this high finish, that thought that 
you know, with all this high finish, you take your eyes away from what really counts. And that is the idea in the piece of sculpture, embodied in the piece of sculpture. And what Mannerists did is they, of course, idealized sculpture, idealized human and animal forms to an extent that they drifted away from the idea and from from the from the idea of, from the divine idea and made beautiful things, and that's where a method that was beautiful in Michelangelo, and maybe even beautiful in Adrian de Vries, was considered by their contemporaries somewhat lesser in Gian Bologna's work, and why was that so? Because Gian Bologna was, of course, um, if. It, of, of, of very much somebody who was as skilled as these people around him. He was just not interested in not finishing sculpture. He was more interested in making all these sculptures also for a certain market. And in making these sculptures, with all the skill he had, he could do it even just a little bit better. Having such an enormous command of sculpting, he could elongate the arms a little bit and legs a little bit to make the human form just a little bit more beautiful according to the, to the idea of beauty of the time, which isn't in this respect so much different from ours. Long legs are still considered quite beautiful. To make figures stand a little more balanced, a little more bravoure, a little more elegance than was strictly necessary for his contemporaries who, you know, for the taste of some of his contemporaries. And I think that's what the mannerism comes from. It's become a manner rather than an idea. It's become a method rather than the embodiment of genius. And the thing is that in their own right, they of course started using this term as a, as a, as a term not of abuse, but a, a, a term that you know, marks a style that has its own right of existing. And it goes on, the fobs, the... Absolutely, the yeah. absolutely. So there seemed to be at one point a time when when Jean Bologna was trying to be wooed away from the Medici by Rudolf II in Praga, and he, at that time, didn't want to leave probably the warm climate, for one thing, and why didn't he go? Well, I, th I think the most important thing to know is that when, 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 uh, when Jean Bologna pointed um, at Adrian de Vries, and said to the representatives of the court in Prague, this is the man you ought to have because I don't really want to come to Prague. Um, he was heading the most successful sculptural workshop in Europe, uh, possibly I can make the claim in the world, uh, where everybody who was worth his salt in artistry would come and study and complete uh, their education um, and uh, be close to one of uh, the most powerful families in, in, uh, in Italy, and one of the richest families in Europe. If he would have left it for the court in Prague, besides the fact that Giamologna wasn't, of course, the youngest anymore, um, he would have left a whole series of very, very faithful um, pupils, apprentices, people that were valuable as sculptors themselves, and whose work is in these ex exhibitions, as, as Pietro Tacca and Portigiani. And it, it didn't seem quite worth it to, to leave such an enormously successful company and such an enormously um, fertile climate for his sculpture to go to a, a, a king who was powerful and rich also quite a bit away from, from, from Florence, where everybody even at that time thought culture resided. Um, and, and, and I think that, that really made him decide that it really wasn't his place to go. It was, a, they needed a pioneer, somebody who had made his own workshop in Prague. Um, and Adrian de Vries did exactly that. And it became very successful, and uh, there seemed to be, from what I noted in the Adrien de Vries show, a kind of developing rivalry to sort of maybe cut the cords with his master or something. Uh, he too tried to 
go beyond Jean Bologna's balance and uh, yeah. uh, form. Yeah, I, th I think that's exactly right. I, I, I think, I, see, we, we don't exactly know that this rivalry takes place. It's just very plausible that it has taken place. Both of what we know how tensions arise between pupils and masters, but also, of course, predominantly because their styles are so very similar at the beginning of Ariane de Vries's career and turn out to be so different at the end. And I think that, I mean, there are two, two, there are basically two reasons to say that there's at least been a sort of distance between their styles. And one is that, or one is a style difference, and another is a, is a, is a, is a work habit that's very different. One, of course, is Jean Bologna uh, at the head of this enormously successful workshop uh, was ready to do anything, really, if you wanted any statue of his and you wanted it just a little bit larger or uh, in, uh, in, in gold rather than silver or in bronze or with an extra, extra torch or something, then John Bologna would find a way to do it. That's why there are many statues or statuettes of John Bologna because this was a, this was a, a fledgling but still growing market. And I think that Adrian de Vries was very much charmed by the idea of, of, of Michelangelo, right? The artist is just a little bit above the rest of mankind, where he easier grasps the ideas that God has for us, and therefore has this, has this sort of semi-godly grip on the things that he makes. And of course, having this godly grip, you don't use it twice, you only use it once. You make this one statue and that's it. And you go on to the next godly idea, right? So from their point of view, um, Giambologna is, is, uh, is, is uh, to some extent wasting his enormous genius into, even though Giambologna never did this himself, of course, he had all his assistants do it, but they believe that, you know, you take away, you thin, you thin your talents by going to all this sort of extra, into all this extra effort. And I think that Adrian de Vries, who used, of course, the medium par excellence to reproduce, must have had some feeling that it wasn't quite right what Jean Bologna did, and decided to destroy all the models that he made directly after it the statue that was cast was approved. So there's very few statues made by Adrian Ries of which a second one exists. I think there may be two or three. And he said, this is my statue, this is my divine grasp on, 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 uh, on the world, you know, this is what I make, and there's no second one. So that's one thing in which he's very different. And second, you see with his style that to some extent, if this is the only statue that he makes and the only ideal that he casts in bronze, that he's not so interested in finish anymore. He's very much interested more in composition, much less in balance, much less in all the bravoure of, the, of, the, of mannerism, that, it, that is, how balanced can you make something? How can you make this really heavy bronze stand on a very, very thin ledge and still stand up straight, right? But he was much more interested in how do I make a composition that has some effect, that moves the, the, the viewer in other ways, or that casts this idea that I have in a more perfect form. Perfect not meaning finished, but perfect meaning more true to the ideal. And that's where you see that, especially the later Anya Nefis, casts all kinds of statuary that is is much less finished in some ways. The expression is less finished. The, the, the way the bodies are made is less finished. There's also very many traces of finish on, the, on those statues, but it's nothing like Jean Bologna. And there you can see they've really drifted apart in, in, in what the ideal of sculpture is. Now this collection that you have on display here is primarily the work of a collector in New York, as I believe. All of it. All of it is a uh, collector, and uh, what is his principal interest in this? Well, Michael Hall has a 
has a has an interesting career because he started as a, as a Hollywood actor in the 40s and then uh, never really climbing out of the category of B movie actor he decided you know quite quite uh, quite early on he always uh, having had a taste for uh, visual arts and especially sculpture that he was going to be an art dealer so he's been actually both collecting and dealing in arts for perhaps 40 years now and in the meantime he has uh, collected in his house an enormous amount of sculptures not only of Jean Bologna but there's there's a beautiful collection of Udon statuary and there are many others that he has and he collects in his house and you'll find in his bedrooms and in his living rooms and um, and he uh, has really, I think, by far the most beautiful private collection of Gian Bologna sculpture. And uh, he's just completely, if you see him with this, I mean, installing this show with him, you see that the immense care that he walks around his statues as if they're his children. It's, he is just, besides some very, very Kenny entrepreneurial uh, insights, you know, because making this collection known to the world, even though this is never going to be sold because it's promised to the Metropolitan Museum in New York, people will know him and maybe buy something in the future. But of course, on the other hand, he's become a connoisseur in his own right. And there are certain statues that he doesn't want to sell and that he wants to keep close. And he's very, very... Um, he he really loves the statuary. I mean, it, it's the best word I can find for it. So, how long will this show be on display here in the Van Loon, and until. will it go anywhere else besides here? Yeah, well, it will be uh, here through March 14, 1999, and uh, and and um, there are now negotiations with a with a, a, a Parisian gallery that may uh, take the show over from here at that point. So. At the late spring, uh, if everybody's lucky, it will be in, uh, in, in Paris. It'll be moved to Paris, and then maybe it'll be opening in, in April. Okay. Valentine, that was uh, very informative. Uh, thank you for all this information.